So remember Mantle's Theorem, right? This thing, I mean, you're all now getting very used to this because if, you, if you're playing with your assignment, it keeps coming up over and over and over. Uh, this fact that if you have a graph with uh, n vertices, and if the graph has more than n squared over four edges, then it has a triangle. Or in other words, kind of in the contrapositive, if G has no triangles, then the number of edges is at most n squared over four. Okay, so this is kind of just saying it in reverse. So of course, one over four is 0.25, right? 25% of n squared or whatever. Um, so the kind of question we're going to be addressing today is the following. So what can we say about a graph that has, let's say, for example, 0.26 times n squared edges? So by Mantle, by Mantle's theorem, uh, you can't have less than a full edge. Yeah, so there's no such thing as half an edge or something. So let's say, because because of divisibility, divisibility, I, I, I'm, what I mean is at least 0.26 n squared. Yeah, so by Mantle's theorem, obviously, if you had 0.26 times n squared edges, that's more than 0.25, right? So there's at least one triangle. Um, but that sounds pretty weak, right? So you know, to just say that there's at least one triangle isn't very good. What we want to say is like, how many triangles must you have? So we want to kind of quantify uh, how many triangles you have. Oh, sorry, that the audio is not so great. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to kind of try to at least n triangles, probably. Um, but we're going to we're going to show that actually you can get a heck of a lot more. So that's going to be the goal of uh, this this lecture. So basically, we're we're looking at this this question. You know, you have more than the extremal number of edges. We want to say how many triangles must you have? Uh, this is something which is called sometimes in combinatorics a supersaturation problem. Um, supersaturation means like the graph G is like more than saturated, meaning like you know if I, if I if I say that so if I know Mantle's theorem, you know, with more than if you have uh, no triangles, you can't have more than n squared over four edges. And this is kind of asking if you go past that point where you have to have triangles, the question becomes how many triangles must you have? Okay, so it's so more generally in a kind of supersaturation problem for graphs, um, you imagine G is a graph with more than the extremal number of edges for H, right? E X and H, and you want to say how many copies of H must it have? And here we're just dealing with the case that H is K3 today. Oh, definitely. Definitely, that's a whole, yeah, there's uh, there's papers on, on that sort of thing. Yeah, where you're looking, yeah, you don't, if you, yeah, if you want to count uh, edge disjoint and vertex disjoint, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, but yeah, so, so here we're just counting triangles overall. So we don't care if they share edges and vertices, we're just trying to count them. So this is going to be the main thing we've proved today, uh, the Goodman bound. So let G be a graph with n vertices and I want to kind of quantify um, how dense this graph is, like how many edges it has, essentially. And I'm going to do that in a way that might seem strange at first, but it's actually kind of, in some sense, it's kind of natural as well. So, so I define L. So G is just any graph at this point. I define alpha, ooh, which is maybe I should have chosen a different Greek letter, but this is not alpha, which is the independence number, right? This is just some number that I'm defining, alpha, and I define it to be two times the number of edges over n squared, which is kind of like, it's roughly um, the number of edges in G over n choose two. Okay, it's not equal to this, but remember n choose two is like, is rough, I mean, it, well, n choose two is equal to n times n minus one over two, which is kind of like n squared over two. <clears throat> So what Goodman proved is then that the number of triangles in G is at least alpha times two alpha minus one times n cubed over six, where n cubed over six is kind of like, you know, so just this factor here, n cubed over six is kind of like n choose three, right? And n choose three is the number of triangles you have in a complete graph. n choose two is the number of edges you have in a complete graph, right? Um, is the statement of this clear? So we'll kind of analyze this a bit more in a second, but uh, just to check that it makes sense. By the way, one thing is that this uh, this thing implies Mantle's theorem, first, by the way, uh, but maybe we'll see that in a second. Let's kind of plot some values here, okay? So 
I've got a graph. I, I define alpha to be um, like this. And I say the number of triangles must be at least this. Let's plot. Let's just plot this function. This is just some quadratic in terms of alpha. So if you think of alpha as being a variable, all this is is a quadratic. So what do we get when we put? So I'm going to plot this function like f of alpha equals alpha two alpha minus one. So what do you get when you put alpha equals a half? Yeah. So that's actually one of the roots of the polynomial. So alpha equals a half is here. If you're between zero and a half. Um, you get a negative number. So between zero and a half, it kind of looks, so at zero, it's zero. So it looks like this. Um, what about alpha equals one? So I'm looking at this vertical line. So what's one times two minus one? Almost. Oh, so there's not gonna, we're not doing any, so I'm, I'm plotting this F, which is like without any N choose three. But, so I'm plotting this one. It's one, yeah. <laughs> it it's harder it's harder than you think to just plug in a number, but yeah, it's one times two minus one. <laughs> okay, so it's up here. So the way you should be thinking of this is that like because remember n choose two is kind of like n squared over two. So alpha is kind of like the proportion of edges that the graph has, right? So alpha is like like percentage of edges. That are present. My f of alpha times, well, yeah, my f of alpha is like a lower bound. Uh, so f of alpha is a lower bound on the, um, you know, percentage of triangles present. Because like the total number of triangles in the complete graph is n choose three, which, okay, there's always this awkward thing that this is not n choose three, and that is, you know, it's n cubed over six, but it's basically the same thing as n choose three. So this kind of gives a, a sensible answer in terms of like for minimizing triangles in a graph with a certain number of edges in the sense that like it's kind of sensible at this point, right? Because if I have 100% of the edges, then I have 100% of the triangles. That makes sense. Is that clear? So this one one makes sense. So what about this, uh, this one half here being at the, uh, does that make sense? Um, or also the fact that this is above zero when uh, alpha is bigger than a half. So what does alpha bigger than a half mean? Right. So if I plug in for alpha, it means that the number of edges is, uh, yeah, sorry. The, the, so if alpha is bigger than a half, it means two times number of edges over n squared is bigger than a half, which means that number of edges is greater than n squared over four. Yeah, so when alpha is bigger, bigger than a half, there exists a triangle by Mantle's theorem, right? And that's exactly what's going on here at this half. This uh, this curve is crossing the x-axis, which means that if the number of e if if the kind of edge density is over here, if it's above a half, there must be a triangle. So, you know, f of alpha is this this line, right? This quadratic. Um, and what Goodman says is that the number of tri the kind of density of triangles must be above f of alpha for every alpha. Is this clear? So that's that, that's why Goodman implies Mantle's theorem. Because if, yeah, because alpha being bigger than a half is the same as uh, all of these things. Is that clear? So this is a strengthening of Ma Mantle's theorem, you know, because if I plug in any value which is bigger than a half, it gives me something bigger than zero. Um, and and it's, a, it's a stronger statement in the sense that it gives a lower bound for every edge density, right? So this, basically this point here corresponds to like the, you know, this can be attained if I take a, a complete bipartite graph, right? This is gonna be a graph, actually this is on your assignment, um, where alpha is a half and um, number of triangles equals zero, which is equal to f of a half, right? Okay, not sure if that's clear or not, but, but let's, uh, so are there any questions about this before I prove the theorem? And this point up here basically corresponds to Kn right? Because it has all the edges and it has all the triangles. All good. Okay. Okay. So this is, at the top, this is just what we want to prove. Um, <laughs> no worries. So this thing inside of this kind of blue-gray box is what we want to prove. So here's the proof. And the proof is going to follow pretty much the exact same steps that we use to prove Mantle's theorem, okay? Except that this time we're going to kind of keep track of the number of triangles instead of saying that it's zero. Right in Mantle, we were able to write 
number of triangles is zero, and that was used uh, in the proof. Here we can't do that. Um, okay, so let t be the number of triangles, and for each edge, I'm going to define t u v to be the number of triangles containing the edge u v. Okay, so it's just the number of, you know, if we, I've got u and v, just the number of triangles that hang off of that edge. Now, oh, actually, I was going to do a poll on this one. Um, so what is the, in terms of t, as a function of t, what is, if I sum up over all edges in the graph, and I add up, you know, I take t u v and add that up over all u v in the uh, edges, uh, what does that give me in terms of t? So you've got some options here. Is it, is it t cubed? Is it t, is it 6t, t squared? Is it, I don't feel like thinking, so I'll wait for the answer, which is a perfectly fine choice. Well, so if you think about it, this, if you think about this sum, right, if I look at a given triangle, how many times does it get counted? That's the, really, that's the, the question here. And the triangle has three edges. So it gets counted once when I, you know, when I consider that, this pair, this edge, I mean, it gets counted once. It gets counted once when I can consider the other edge and it gets counted once when I consider the third edge. So overall, each triangle gets counted three times, uh, so it's equal to 3t, okay, which was the kind of majority uh, response. Okay, so uh, okay, so the sum of t u v over all edges is 3t. Okay, so now I want to, uh, um, now I want to look at t u v in terms of the vertices u and v. So if I look at the vertices u and v, um, okay, the picture is down here, right? And I look at their neighborhood. So, so the yellow and the so here in this picture, the yellow and the green is the uh, neighborhood of U, and the green and the blue is the neighborhood of V. So in terms of the now, okay, so now in terms of the neighborhoods, um, what can I say about T U V? So for a particular pair U and V, if you think about it, it's just the size of the intersection of the neighborhoods, right? So it's just the size of yeah. And u intersect n v because everything in this set gives me a triangle containing u and v, and vice versa. Every triangle containing u and v is like a common neighbor of u and v, right? So something in here wouldn't give me a triangle because it's a neighbor of u but not of v, and so on. So <laughs> not well, maybe you could write it as inclusion exclusion, but we'll see. Uh, so um, so. Uh, what did I want to say here? Uh, okay, so the degree of u plus the degree of v. So I'm going to kind of write this. Okay, I mean, uh, maybe I'll take more than one step. So actually, yeah, it is kind of inclusion exclusion. So the degree of u plus the degree of v is the sum of the uh, um, sizes of the neighborhoods, which is the same thing as taking the union of the neighbor. Well, or maybe I'll, maybe I won't do. Okay, maybe it is inclusion exclusion. I'm not sure, but let's see. So it's like the neighborhood of u. So if I kind of count this yellow set, so I mean, when I take this, this sum, it counts the green stuff twice, the yellow stuff once, and the blue stuff uh, once, right? So this gets counted once, that gets counted twice, that gets counted once. So it looks like this. So, so I get a two here times the um, intersection. Oh, oh dear which is the same as uh, if I was to write. So actually, yeah, so here's the kind of inclusion exclusion part, I guess. So if I took you know, this plus this plus just one of these, that equals the, the union of the two neighborhoods. But then I have plus the intersection because I've got an extra one of those. The union of the two neighborhoods, so just to do a kind of really weak bound on it kind of, that's at most the number of vertices in the whole graph, right? And then this term, the intersection is just equal to TUV. We already said that, right? That's what we wrote up here. Okay. So now is now is where we get um, a kind of blast from the past. So it's a lemma that we've already seen before in the proof of Mantle's theorem. So let me remind you of that. Uh, so yeah, this is back a few weeks ago uh, in the proof of Mantle's theorem. We proved that this lemma that says that if I add up so if I add over all the edges in the graph, and I look at the, the degree of u plus the degree of v, that's the same thing as if I add up over all vertices of 
the graph and take the degrees squared, which looks looks kind of weird. Um, but the reason is, well, I mean, the reason these two things are equal, so there's a nice combinatorial proof, which says that both sides of the equality count triples A, B, C uh, of vertices such that A, B is an edge and B, C is an edge. So we've already done this proof, so I maybe won't go through all the details again, but in some sense, this side of the inequality kind of picks, it picks like a triple like this, where it picks uh, B first. Whereas this side of the inequality does something, a or this of the equality does something a little bit strange. It kind of picks an edge E and then labels the endpoints of E, uh, A and B in some, it, so it goes over both of the different ways to do that. And then third, it like picks C. But anyway, we, we've seen that proof before. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use this thing. Um, okay, so back to the proof. Um, so the sum of the degrees squared, as we said, is equal to, so from the previous lemma, that's the sum over all edges of the degree of u plus the degree of v. Um, and we already, we, we got something for this, right? Degree of u plus degree of v, we said, is at most the number of vertices in the graph plus the triangles containing u and v. That's what we did two slides back. Okay, so if I want to apply that, I plug in this upper bound, you know, into here, right? And I get that it's at, everything is at most. Um, so number of edges of g times number of vertices of g. That's what I get here because it's, I'm just looking at, uh, that just comes from this part. Yeah, times the, or plus the sum of the TUVs over all the edges. <clears throat> Which, um, we already said something about this, right? This is equal to 3t. So it's, yeah, so this is the number of edges times the number of vertices plus 3t. Okay, so now, okay, so I've got this equality or this inequality involving the sum of the degrees squared. Uh, so hopefully you're getting used to this kind of thing by now, but uh, I want to apply some convexity result to get a uh, lower bound on this. Right, that's what we've done like now quite a few times. Um, so if yeah, if you use the thingy, so it's actually in the, it's back here on my video. This convexity inequality, which is kind of, it's kind of an application of Cauchy-Schwarz or Jensen's inequality or whatever. But we saw that when we talked about the appendices. Uh, so this is at least the sum of the degrees, um, all squared, over the number of vertices in G. Oh, yeah, so I was going to ask you to fill in the blanks here, but we might run low on time, so I, I think I should just kind of fill in the blanks myself. Uh, okay, so putting all this together. So by the way, so what's the sum of the degrees, right? That's by handshaking, this is just twice the number of edges. So I can plug that in and I can put that, you know, on the, you know, I can put that as a lower bound on on the, the first thing in this uh, this thing we derived earlier. So... So, okay, here n is the number of vertices, as usual. So twice the number of edges over uh, squared over the number of vertices, which is this lower bound we just proved on the sum of the degrees squared, is at most n times number of edges plus 3t. And now we just plug in our um, <clears throat> assumption about the number of edges. So it's equal to alpha n squared over 2. So a bit of algebra here. Um, right, so... How on earth did I get all this? Well, yeah, I guess I just plugged this in, right? So this alpha n squared over two is from here, right? Uh, I've got alpha here, n squared over two from here with an extra n, and I've subtracted that to the other side. I've divided everything by three, okay? And then magically, if you do some factoring, um, so here, we wanted to get a lower bound on the number of triangles. And yeah, if you do a little bit of factoring and stuff, you'll see that this does give you exactly what you wanted, which was alpha times two alpha minus one times n cubed over six is at most t. So t the number of triangles is at least this value. So is that too fast? Is that, or is that okay? Any questions? <clears throat> yeah. I never know how much, how long I should actually take doing algebra because <laughs> I know you can all do it yourself, but at the same time, if I just, 
say, oh, this holds, then, you know, it might not be clear. <laughs> I know you can all do it. <laughs> yeah, for me too. That's the part I mess up is the algebra, usually. <laughs> yeah, Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> I use that a lot. Um, oh yeah, so let's go back to this question from the beginning, right? I asked you, um, you know, suppose G has n vertices and 0.26 uh, times n squared edges, okay? How many triangles must it have? So Goodman's bound gives you like a, some kind of a lower bound on this quantity. So if, if the number of edges is, is this, n squared, um, you know, 0.26 times n squared, Remember, alpha, alpha was defined to be 2 times the number of edges over n squared. So that's just, uh, yeah, well, it's just 0.52. And if you plug that in to Goodman's bound, you get that, okay. And obviously for this, I used Wolfram alpha. Um, so it's like 0 0.0208 uh, times n, n cubed over 6 tri uh, triangles. Okay, not that exciting, but... That kind of gives, that gives some kind of an answer to the question from the, from the beginning that I gave you. You could then ask, is this the right answer? In the sense, like, yes, this is a lower bound. This is a lower bound, but is it the right lower bound? <clears throat> so there's, there's a thing in the chat about this being cool, but not necessarily applicable. So the a slight issue with, with this course is that I'm not going to go much beyond this, um, but... I can tell you that things like supersaturation results, in particular, this one we're talking about today, this Goodman bound, are super applicable. Um, but you don't really get to see that unless you go a bit deeper. So it's applicable, in, for example, in Ramsey theory. <laughs> it's applicable, you know, yeah, to, to understand the uh, kind of growth rate of Ramsey numbers, for example. This has been a very important uh, bound for that. Like this, specifically, the thing we proved today was used uh, for that. Also, things like counting graphs which don't have triangles and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I also like Uno. <laughs> yeah, so point, yeah, point zero two oh eight times n cubed over 6, uh, well, triangles, like that is extremely weird. Um, something so weird doesn't seem like it could be the answer, right? It, so it turns out it's in this particular, for the point two six n squared uh, edges case, it's not quite the answer. Um, but in some cases, Goodman's bound is tight. So this, by the way, what I'm going to tell you now is kind of giving away one of the questions from assignment four. Um, but, you know, I just had to do it. So, <laughs> so uh, right. So remember, I said that when alpha is a half, so that's the same as having n squared over four edges. And we had a tight example for Goodman, which is the uh, complete bipartite graph because it has like alpha is a half in this graph because it has n squared over four edges. So, okay, there's this, this factor of two going on in, in this. So alpha equals a half means, you know, edges is n squared over four. So the extra factor of two is just because n choose two is not n squared. It's kind of n squared over two. Uh, so if you have half the edges, you have about n squared over four edges and you have like f of a half n cubed over six which is zero triangles. So the kind of if I'm plotting like where the complete bipartite graph is, it's right on this dot. I've also got a tight example. It turns out when alpha is two thirds, um, which this is the part that's kind of giving away the homework, but I don't really care. Uh, so if I take a complete tripartite graph with parts of the same size. So this is a graph which has alpha equal to two thirds. And if you do the counting, which, so that's the part that's, I guess you'll have to do in the assignment. Um, so you'll have to count how many triangles this thing has. But if you check the number of triangles is um, F of two thirds. So this F is this alpha two alpha minus one, right? So this is F, F of alpha is this thingy. It has uh, F of alpha n squared over six triangles. So it's perfectly t tight for Goodman's bound. Can anyone guess what the t what tight example I get when I have uh, alpha equals three quarters? It's like guess the pattern. Yeah, quadripartite. I, I don't know if that's actually a word. Probably not. Or quarpartite. That that sounds like it could be. It could it could maybe be a word. Maybe it's not though. But anyway, fourpartite. Let's call it. 
So complete four part type graph. So yeah, again, it's a tight example and it sits right here. Uh, for some reason I skipped uh, four fifths, but you know, somewhere four is four fifths, then six, seven, seven eighths. This picture might not be to scale, by the way. <laughs> I don't know where seven eighths is. But anyway, so you get all these tight examples. Um, the, but the, the specific question we were asking was about like alpha equals 0.52, which is not one of these special numbers. Like, so here the numbers are like one minus one over K, right? That's the densities of, so the density of a complete K part type graph is density. When I say density, I mean the alpha value, which is twice the number of edges over number or over N squared. Uh, so if I have complete K part type, the alpha value is one minus one over K. Um, but what about the 0.52 thing, right? So that doesn't, that's not one of these spe special numbers. Um, so that kind of begs the question, like, what would I do if I want a good construction, which is between the number of edges of this graph, the bipartite and the tripartite? So does anyone have a guess for what you should do? Like if I wanted to minimize the number of triangles and I have an edge density between these two values, this, I mean, this is hard, but so I'm just asking you to guess. You're not supposed to know the answer, but whoa, that's, yeah. So th that's, yeah, that's the right answer. So in some sense, uh, you want to interpolate between, I mean, a natural thing to try to do is try, try to interpolate. So if you're interpolating on the, you're trying to get the number of edges to go between the number of edges in this graph and the number of edges in that graph, you're kind of trying to interpolate. So interpolate just means, right, try to, you have these isolated values and you try to go between them and kind of go continuously between them, then the natural thing to do is try to interpolate between the two constructions, right? Which is like, imagine I take this tripartite thing and so this one, like every part has size one third of the number of vertices and you could think about kind of shrinking one part and growing the other ones or something, right? So the something between a bipartite graph and a a balanced tripartite graph is like a tripartite graph where one part is tiny, right? And the other parts are big. So that is a natural choice. Um, and for a long, and, but here's the thing that doesn't, uh, that construction doesn't match this uh, lower bound, unfortunately. So it looks like, so when you take these interpolating constructions, they, the number of the triangle density looks like this. If you kind of plot it on this curve which is kind of unfortunate for Goodman's bound, right? It means that, well, at least these constructions aren't the best um, or they don't match Goodman's bound. Um, so for a long time, it was unknown whether this was, uh, well, what the answer was. Like, is there a graph where the density is somewhere in here or is this pink line actually a lower bound on the triangle density? Yeah, so this is the picture from, from one of the discrete math talks um, a few weeks ago. Um, but anyway, so it turns out that this interpolating type of construction is actually the best. So, so this pink line is actually a lower bound, which is improves um, Goodman's bound. So, so anyway, the message here is Goodman's bound is tight, but only for these isolated values where the alpha is equal to one minus one over K and otherwise it's not tight. Um, and, uh, and that's a, a very deep and difficult uh, uh, theorem.